This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Thursday, July 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Forgery Division. The boss is Captain Frankel. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Bill wasn't feeling well. It was 106 outside and he had hot dogs for lunch. His stomach ached. He didn't know it, but we were both about to trade his stomach problem in on a headache. Oh, I'll be all right. Well, I hope you're ready for this. That was Charlie Feeney on the phone. You remember Charlie, don't you? Sure, the wino who used to be in vaudeville. Soft shoe and muscatel. I don't think I could take him today, Joe. What's the problem? Well, a big one for Charlie and maybe a bigger one for us. He claims he's been swindled out of $9,000, but that's only part of it. $9,000? He never had that much money in his life. That's the problem. The money wasn't his. Bill and I headed for Charlie Feeney's rooming house on South Figueroa. Charlie was a part-time wino. He'd been booked as plain drunk a few times, and on occasion, he'd been helpful as a police informant. Top billing then, Sergeant. Gaty Theater, 1922. My first big year in the circuit. Now watch this, Sergeant. Charlie, now look, it's a hot day. Let's make it easy on ourselves. You can tell us about your vaudeville days later. Tell us about the $9,000. Where'd you get that kind of money, Charlie? All right, Mr. Cannon. Gannon with a G. Sure, Gannon. Say, you're in relation to the dancing Gannons from Moline. I played with them in a bill once in 1926. No. Charlie, you called us, remember? Now, maybe you're in trouble, maybe you're not. If you are, we'd like to help you. Now, tell us about it, will you? Well, I guess I did wrong, Mr. Friday. I don't know. I'm scared. Maybe the heat's got me, too. It was yesterday, about noon. I'm walking down Fig, and I see it. This folded $1,000 bill right there on the sidewalk. Where on Figueroa? Near 17th, just a couple of blocks from here, in front of that all-night mission, I think. Well, I'm stunned. I don't see a bill like that since I was working the Orpheum circuit. Then I become further stunned to find eight more $1,000 bills folded inside of the first bill, just as neat and clean as you please. Tell us the rest of it. Well, I guess I wasn't thinking right. The first thing that comes to my mind is what a party I can throw for my pals at the Ruby Room. At the Ruby Room? Yeah, it's a saloon I hang out in when I got a few bucks. The boys seem to like my old routines. They even put up one of my posters. <laughs> sort of a celebrity there. Okay, Charlie, then what happened? Well, I should have known. Al, he's the bartender. Al couldn't crack a thou. I mean, they got some spenders in there, but no Rockefellers. I like the joint and all the guys, but I realize it don't have much class. And I've seen class in my day, Sergeant Friday. Go on, Charlie. Well, like I said, Al can't break it, but he gives me 20 bucks and this note for 980 on the balance. I've known him for a long time. He never cheated me or nothing, so I figure everything is beautiful. Boy, were the fellas glad to see me. I guess everybody had a good time because the 20 was gone when I woke up and nobody in there drinks expensive stuff. When you woke up, did you have the balance of the money? Yes, sir, Sergeant. Every penny, $8,000, all of it. I don't quite understand, Charlie. Now, when you telephoned, you said you were swindled out of the money. Now you say you have all of it. Oh, no, Sergeant Friday. I had it when I woke up, about 10 o'clock last night. That private detective banging on the door got me up. Private detective. Go on, Charlie. Yeah. This bird flashes a badge and claims he's a private detective working for a big Las Vegas gambler who wants his $9,000 back. Wants it back? Yeah. This private detective says the gambler lost it and he wants it back. Do you know how he traced it to you? No, I was scared. And this guy looked tough like those movie hoods. Everything he said was making sense to me. I didn't want trouble, so I give him the $8,000 and he tells me I better keep quiet or I'll be in a real jam with the law. Said he knew I stole the money. Well, technically, Charlie, it comes under Section 485 of the Penal Code, Theft of Lost Property. Why didn't you report finding the money in the first place? Well, like I told you, I wasn't thinking right. But I was going to call you fellas after I had a little fun with the nine grand. You know I always cooperate when I can, right, Sergeant Friday? We appreciate that. Now, can you describe this man, the private detective? Oh, I don't think I can give you much. I was pretty rocky. Fat. Big and fat. 
That's about all I can remember, a big fat guy. That's not very much to go on, but I got a hunch where we can start looking for him. The Ruby Room. Oh, I never seen him in the Ruby Room before, Sergeant Friday. Maybe not, but ten to one, somebody in there knows him. Now, you said this so-called private detective claims his Las Vegas pal lost $9,000. Is that right? Right. Now, why do you suppose he didn't say something about the other bill when you handed over the 8000 I don't know. Because he knew where it was? Exactly. Now, you try to stay sober, Charlie. We'll be in touch. The Ruby Room, is that that place down there, 17th and Flower? That's it. Chicago, 1928, the State Lake Theater. I played there for 11 weeks. Boy, I really killed him. I'm telling you, they hit me with a lavender, and I had two of the cutest little bimbos you've ever seen, one on each side of me with pink parasols. And I was all dressed in black and white. White lapels, black coat, white flannel pants. Oh, I'm telling you. 2.15 p.m. The Ruby Room was a long way from opening night at the palace. From the looks of it, some of the acts that started here probably ended up in the county jail. The bartender identified himself as Al Roth, a part owner of the saloon. You know a man named Charlie Feeney? Charlie? Yeah, I know Charlie. Spend much of his time in here, does he? Comes in here all the time. The great little character. Used to be in vaudeville. That's one of his old posters up there. That's Charlie, great little song and dance man. Why, is he in trouble? Yeah, about $9,000 worth, and from what we've learned, you've got 980 of it. Listen, officers, I ain't no con man. I give Charlie a note for it. I was doing him a favor. You couldn't expect me to break a grand. We know all about that, Roth. We've got your note. I don't suppose I could have it back. Sorry, Roth, it's evidence, just like this $1,000 bill. Here's a receipt for both of them. You know, that note shouldn't concern you, Roth, unless you have some special interest in the matter, like about $8,000. Look, it ain't me, officers. I mean, I think I know what the gig is, but I've told you the truth. I'm no con man. All right, suppose you tell us what you do know about it. Right up front, you've got to understand that I never made a deal with nobody to cheat Charlie. I don't even know how much money is involved. You say $8,000? Okay, it's $8,000. But me and Charlie was only concerned with a grand, and you know I gave him 20 bucks and a note for 980. And I gave the grand back to you. If I tell you what I think you're after, am I clear? Providing everything checks out. Well, after Charlie gets the 20, he starts buying for the house. They know his style. They line up like it was a soup kitchen. They're all getting pretty barreled. And Charlie says the party's going to last till St. Patrick's Day, because he claims he's got a fortune with him. Says he hit the daily double. The dope flashes more bills, but I didn't see $8,000 worth. All right, go on. About 8 p.m., Charlie caves in. He does his little dance and hits all the walls on his way out. He's mumbly, and I figure he's a candidate to get rolled. But I can't walk him home, can I? All right, what's the rest of the story? I think you'll find it right over there. Guy in the red shirt. He's a real flake. His name's Bevo. Don't know his last name. Doesn't come in too often, but usually starts trouble when he does. All day long, he's been cussing Charlie Feeney, yelling about big money and a deal that blew up. I think you better talk to Bevo. Thanks, Roth. Excuse us, fella. We'd like to talk to Bevo. Police officers, you're Bevo, are you? Yeah, I'm Bevo. We'd like to talk to you. What's your full name? Well, uh, Your full name? Frank Bavona. They call me Bevo for short. You ever been arrested? Arrested? Yeah, lots of times. Nothing big, though. Mostly drunk. You know Charlie Feeney? Big mouth show off, little creep. Tell us about Charlie and the big money. You gonna arrest me? You arrest me, I don't say nothing. All we want is the truth. It was a joke. I wasn't going to go through with it. That Feeney really bugs me. So, aren't you guys going to buy me a beer? What about the money? Okay, the little bum is buying drinks and flashing money. Says he hit the daily double. Listen, he's no horse player. You don't know a horse from a cow. I think he stole it. Well, I'm smashed and he's getting to me. Is that when you called for help? Huh? Your pal, the big fat guy. I guess you know everything, huh? Yeah. Bakeman. His name is Paul Bakeman. Go on. What am I telling you about Bakeman, see? He's a fink. He's up across me. I told him that Feeney had a ton of money on him. Maybe eight grand, all thousand dollar bills. And Bakeman and me, we're going to arrange a split. You were to get half just for the information, is that it? Yeah, Bakeman was going to work it out. I didn't want no part of how it would be done. Anyway, when I sobered up, I changed my mind. I was going to back out. And that's it. The whole enchilada. All except $8,000. You tell Bakeman where to find Charlie, right? Right. Where and when were you going to make the split? Here, yeah, when the place opened at 10 o'clock in the morning. Bakeman kind of. Aren't you guys going to buy me a beer? What else can you tell us about Paul Bakeman? He's on time. Hard time? Forgery, I think. Where'd you first meet him? At the track. He's always there. Or in Vegas. Guy's a big gambler, but he don't win. Me, 
I spent all my money on booze. Who needs the horses? Where does Bakeman live, do you know? He was staying at the Proctor Hotel on 8th Street, but he's gone now. I call him a dozen times today. He's a crook. You got any idea where we can find him? Vegas or the track. All right, thanks, people. Hey, aren't you gonna buy me a beer? Hey, that's only enough for one. That's all you need, pal. Three ten p.m. It was still hot. Bill and I headed for the Proctor Hotel where Paul Bakeman had been staying. Three twenty-one p.m. Bevo's story checked out. A man answering the description of Paul Bakeman had registered at the Proctor Hotel under the name of Dave Bates. He had been living there for two weeks. The room clerk described him as a big fat man with a mustache who wore loud neckties. He had checked out about 9.30 a.m. That was a half hour before he was to meet Bevo at Ruby's bar. The clerk said the suspect left no forwarding address. We drove back to Parker Center to put out an APB on Paul Bakeman, alias Dave Bates. I'll give airport detail and the security people out at the track Bakeman's description. Yeah, then we get down to the real problem. Find the money. And where it came from. Thursday, 5 p.m. Just got the dope on Bakeman from R&I. He's a real hard nose. Listen to this. Arrested three times in 1951 on petty theft charges, no convictions. Arrested suspicion of attempted extortion in 1954, no conviction. He wasn't so lucky in 1955. Served three years up at Q for forgery. Got out in 58. Arrested again in 1960 on a bookmaking charge, released for lack of evidence. 1961, felony drunk driving. Killed a 70-year-old woman in a crosswalk. Served time at San Quentin until January this year. Just reading about this guy gives me heartburn. Want a mint? No, thanks. My stomach's fine. Really? I thought you were putting on a little weight. Very funny. I'm true. Yep. Joe, Bill, I think we've got a break in the $9,000 deal. A man answering Bakeman's description was picked up at the Hollywood Burbank Airport by Burbank detectives. Seems the reservations clerk became a little suspicious. Yeah? When he laid down a $1,000 bill for the champagne flight to Vegas. 7.05 p.m. We picked up the suspect, Paul Bakeman, at the Burbank Airport and drove back to Parker Center. We advised Bakeman of his rights. He waived them. All right, is that everything? That's everything. Now let's try to make this painless, Bakeman. Let's try to make this painless. We know all about the split you were supposed to make with Bevo, Frank Bavona. You used a phony badge. You passed yourself off to Charlie Finney as a private detective working for a Las Vegas gambler. You got the $8,000 and you checked out of the Proctor Hotel this morning. You were on your way to Vegas for a big holiday. Now we got the witnesses we need. Let's hear your side of it. You got it all. I made a dumb move. I never thought that old dummy Charlie Finney would go to the cops. When he turned it over to me without any argument, I was positive he'd never go to use guys. I was sure he stole the dough. He's as guilty as I am. Not quite, Bakeman. Charlie says you leaned on him, did you? I didn't use any muscle on him. He scares easy. How would he know anyway? He's a dummy. That'll do it, Bakeman. Let's go downstairs. You gonna book me? About that time, isn't it? That's him. Oh, boy, is that him. You got him, men. Charlie, why don't you have a chair? We'll be with you in a minute. Let's go, Bakeman. I'll be seeing you, dummy. Not for about 50 years you won't, huh, Joe? Isn't that right? Take it easy, Charlie. Uh, how about the money? Did you get the money back? We got it. All eight pieces? All eight. Who's it belong to? Did you find that out yet? Not yet. Well, what if you never do, huh, Joe? What if you never find out who all that money belongs to? I mean, then who gets it? That'll be up to the court. Any chance I'd get to claim it? I got this dream open in my own tavern with honest-to-gosh old-time vaudeville acts. If I could claim it, I mean, if nobody else claims it, would that be in order, huh, Joe? You tell me, Joe. That wouldn't be out of line, really, for me to claim it, would it? Charlie, I don't want to punch a hole in your dream, but don't you think it'd be best if you just got out of this mess as clean as possible? Now, when and if full restitution is made, things should work out right for you. You forget the money, Charlie. Enjoy your freedom, huh? He's all signed in. Stay handy, Charlie. We'll need you for a witness against Bakeman. Oh, I figured I'd skip Bermuda this year anyway. Uh, look, can I go now, officers? We didn't send for you, Charlie. That's right, you didn't. Maybe Bakeman's right. How's that? I'm a dummy. Friday, July 11th, 8.35 a.m. Bill and I checked in for work. Good morning. The HQ Night Watch is doing your work for you again. This came in at 10 p.m. What's that, Captain? The Reverend Theodore Martin of the Good Hope Mission in South Figueroa said one of his congregation, an elderly woman, misplaced a large sum of money. $9,000. Like I said, where would you be without the Night Watch? 
9.05 a.m., Bill and I arrived at the Good Hope Mission. God bless you, young fella. Accept the Lord as your savior, and you'll see the light. Thank you, sir. I hope so. Good morning, my friend. I'm Reverend Martin. May I help you? Yes, sir. We're police officers. This is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Oh, yes, officers. Yes, I called the police station last night about a member of my congregation, Mrs. Periwinkle. You say she lost quite a bit of money, is that right? I'm afraid she did, officers. I've often cautioned Myrtle Periwinkle about carrying so much money on her person. She's very old-fashioned, doesn't believe in banks. Elderly people can be that way, you know. I think she hides money around her house as well. Exactly how much did she lose? Well, officers, she thinks it was $9,000, all in $1,000 bills. And you say she had the money on her person? Unfortunately, yes. Now, this Mrs. Periwinkle, she lives in the neighborhood, does she? Oh, yes, just down the street at the Ivory Tower Apartment Hotel. Mrs. Periwinkle is one of our most loyal supporters. The dear soul was on her way to the mission when she lost her money. Wonderful person, Mrs. Periwinkle. And when did she tell you about the loss of the money? Last night, just after our prayer meeting. She was going to take a small group to the movies. She always does this on Thursdays. Mrs. Periwinkle is a devoted moviegoer. Has been ever since the first ones. Do you know that one night she showed some silent films right here? Got them from an old director friend. She even hired a projectionist and bought candy and popcorn for everyone. She's a rare lady, officers. I do pray that you can help her recover her fortune. Yes, sir, we understand. Would you officers like some cherry cake and lemonade? It's a warm day. No, thank you, Reverend. Thanks, just the same. Reverend, how does Mrs. Periwinkle happen to have so much money? As I understand it, Mr. Periwinkle, he left us many years ago, was a most successful businessman. He was in the picture business, most successful. I believe he left her quite well off. I see. I wonder if we could have her address. Of course, I knew you'd want it. I have it right here. Thank you. That's an awful lot of money for someone to lose, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. A point of information, if I may. You know, if someone loses an article or an item, usually they can identify it by some physical peculiarity. But in a matter like this, should you recover her money, how would you know that it's really hers? That's simple, Reverend. Yes? She'll tell us. We drove over to the Ivory Tower Apartment Hotel on South Figueroa. Mrs. Myrtle Periwinkle lived in apartment three. Yes, who is it? Police officers. Who? Police officers, ma'am. Show me your badge. Well, yes, ma'am, if you'll just open the door, please. Put it up to the people. Beg your pardon? Put it up to the people, please. Yes, ma'am. Move it around. Oh, yes. This is Sergeant Friday. My name's Gannon. Are you Mrs. Periwinkle? Yes, I am, Myrtle Periwinkle. Come in, officers. Won't you sit down, please, officers? I just made some iced tea. Would you like some? That's very nice of you, ma'am, but no, thank you. Your name is Sergeant Friday? Yes, ma'am, that's right. You're very interesting looking, Mr. Friday. Have you ever performed on the screen? No, ma'am. You sure? Yes, ma'am. Now, Mrs. Periwinkle, Reverend Martin down at the Good Hope Mission tells us that you lost a large sum of money. Is that right? Oh, dear, yes. My son is forever scolding me for being so careless. How much money did you lose, ma'am? I believe $9,000. And where did you lose it? Uh, somewhere between the bus stop on Figueroa and 15th and the Mission. I know that because I took the money out of the Bible that morning. Wednesday morning. Bible? Yes. There's no safer place. What thief would think of looking for money in a Bible? Yes, ma'am. I don't understand, Mrs. Periwinkle. Why would you take it with you when you say it's safer here in the Bible? I took it with me because I didn't want it stolen. Yes, ma'am. You should have reported it immediately, Mrs. Periwinkle. I suppose so, but I knew Pastor Martin would do the right thing. He always does the right thing. Miss Periwinkle, you really should put your money in a savings account. You know that. You're taking a dangerous risk hiding it here. A bank? Never. Don't trust them. Never will. Never. Anyway, money is not my God. The Lord is my God. Yes, ma'am, but a bank is still a good place to keep your money. I don't miss the money. It's not important. Besides, I have plenty. Is that right? Over $10,000. Some of it is being held by my son, Roger. My money goes to help my needy friends. My joy is contributing to the Good Hope mission. My late husband, Ernest, left me well fixed. Ernest was in the motion picture business, rented and sold movie equipment in the silent picture days. He also manufactured some of the first sound equipment. Look at this, officers. That's my Ernest with Rudy. 
the Rudy. 19 and 24, taken on the set. Fine-looking man, your husband. We recovered your money, Mrs. Periwinkle. Oh, I love the movies. Of course, today's films are not as thrilling to me as The Silence. Some people say they're too violent, and I miss the old things, the candy butchers and the organ like we had in the old theaters. When I take the mission group to the movies these days, I try to select nice family films. I often read some of the classic silence, you know. So artistic, so full of heart and soul and honesty. Mrs. Periwinkle, we recovered your money. Still, I find life lonely at times. The TV helps. There's a lot of fine old films on TV, but most of them are on too late at night for me. Officers, I want you to see something. I've kept this scrapbook since 1919. Everyone is in here, from Griffith to the Duke. Don Wayne. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful stars, wonderful films, wonderful memories. That's very nice, ma'am. Yes, isn't it? Mrs. Periwinkle, we have some loose ends we have to clear up with you here. Now, you do understand that we've recovered all of your $9,000. Uh huh. Oh, it's such a bother. Perhaps I'll give it all to the mission. So much trouble carrying it around. And like my son keeps telling me, I'm forgetful. Well, we can't tell you what to do with the money, ma'am, or how to run your life. We can only suggest that you make safer arrangements, a savings account or a safety deposit box. Be better all around for you. Oh, it's such a bother. What do you want me to do now? We'd like to have you come downtown with us, ma'am, and sign the necessary forms. We'll clear it all up. You know, officers, I saw a movie like this once, a British mystery. The old woman hid all her life savings in a book of Shakespeare's works. Do you know what happened? No, ma'am. Someone stole it. She should have kept it in her Bible. No thief would look at a Bible. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to come downtown with us now, Miss Periwinkle? Oh. Please, officers, not now. There are things I have to do at the mission. But first, I just have to see this wonderful old musical on TV today. All those elegant dance numbers by Busby Berkeley. What time is it, Mr. Friday? It's 10.30. Oh, good. It starts at 11 o'clock. Won't you stay for tea and watch it with me? I'm sorry we can't, Miss Periwinkle. You'll have to make arrangements to come downtown and fill out those reports. Oh, tell you what. I'll invite you both to the mission the very next time we have a movie night, when you're both off duty. We appreciate that, Miss Periwinkle. Good. And I'll call my son and have him drive me over to the police department tomorrow morning, first thing. That'll be fine, Miss Periwinkle. And perhaps I'll talk to my son about putting my money in a safer place. At least I'll think about it. You do that, Miss Periwinkle. I'm sure your son will feel better not having to worry about your safety as well. And I want to thank both of you for your good work. Why, you're better than any of those movies movie detectives I've seen. Officers, tell me, just what did happen to my money? A man found it down near the mission. Oh, good. Maybe I can get him to join our group. It could help him. Yes, ma'am. It just might. Good day. Good day, ma'am. Kind of hungry. How about you? No, not particularly. What if that offer's still good back at the mission? What offer? You know, we've worked together a long time, but I don't expect you to know everything about me. What do you mean by that? I'm just crazy about cherry cake. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 12th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was convicted on Section 487-1PC, Grand Theft, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state prison from one to 10 years. Charles Feeney and Frank Bavona turned state's evidence, and all charges against them were dropped. <laughs>